allowed to all uh, viewers, readers who are here for Disrupt Cyprus, another Disrupt Cyprus Ask Me Anything session. This is uh, episode six, season two. We're here with uh, David uh, Mihailidis, uh, uh, a guy that actually, um, uh, I have read his first book on creativity and innovation back like 15 years ago, I don't know. 10. Uh, when you launch the, f the first book, but we'll have um, a lot of uh, interaction, etc. First of all, let's start our. Okay, it needs. We. This is a tip also for you. When you do live streams, you can run a watch party uh, via your profile, so you get more followers. You get uh, fewer people who not notified and and get stuff and see the live stream so by the way this is an ask me anything in session as you know uh we do it every monday at 12 pm uh, this is the last uh, the last ama we do at 12 pm from next monday we'll change in the hour so it will be 7 pm uh, because we get more people kind of watch at that time and yeah we expect also your questions to so you can drop them in the comments uh we're going to have a here in discussion a casual chat discussion with dimis about creativity innovation disruption etc um first of all until i see also who is logged in uh, sorry um uh, yeah, Dimis, tell us about you. You're well, I'm Dimis. You're a creative um, guy. Uh, you're a magician. Yeah, shoot. I'm Dimis Michelidis. Good morning, Panis. Um, thank you, Disrupt Cyprus, for uh, your hospitality today. I'm, a, um, I'm an author, a consultant, a trainer, and I specialize in leadership, creativity, and innovation. I've been doing this for about 15 years. Prior to that, I was an executive mostly in large organizations in uh, Washington, D.C., in, based in Paris also, and, um, and in Cyprus. Um. Elaborate. You want more? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. More. Okay, yeah, I also I also more teach. More. Um, I also about teach. Your books. Tell us about I them. teach. Well, um, maybe I, I think um, it's interesting to know that I have um, quite a connection with students as well because I teach um, I teach MBAs and uh, and uh, the bachelor degree students uh, at the Neapolis University Paphos. I teach leadership and organizational behavior and entrepreneurship. Uh, it's quite fascinating because it keeps me in touch with a much um, younger generation of people for the undergraduates and for the postgraduates, uh, the people with um, some maturity who have some business experience and who are interested in entrepreneurship and leadership and organizational behavior. Um, my book. Um, I, my first book. Yeah, let's start from your first book. Okay, my first book was uh, published in uh, two thousand and seven, at the end of two thousand and seven. So it's about eleven, a little bit over um, eleven years old. Uh, it's called "The Art of Innovation: Integrating Creativity in Organizations," and it's a business book which contains a model of how to make an organization more innovative. And it is illustrated with the artwork, and it's real artwork, it's not simply graphics, uh, it's actual paintings, 16 paintings which were made for the book by one of the greatest artists we have in Cyprus, uh, Umid Inachi. Yeah, that's, that's actually back then when I was reading the book, it makes yeah. me the interest that you combine art, creativity, images with innovation. And Right. You see, I wanted um, I wanted uh, a book with a visual uh, character, but I did not want to have any no flow charts, no bar charts, no pie charts, no two by two matrices. So I went. 
for pure, um, uh, pure artwork, if you like. Uh, I also wrote a book in the meantime, which is a science fiction novella, I would call it, called Y2.200K, yeah. a chronicle. And I'm just about to publish a third one, which I think is interesting, which is called The Heart of Innovation. And the next one will be, and the next one will be coming up before the end of the year, which will be called the Act of Innovation. And uh, okay, you have also an upcoming book presentation, I've seen. Um, yes, the um, my um, uh, my uh, sci-fi book. I'm yeah. doing a short presentation on the second of April, um, with a little reading um, at Pie Bakery in Nicosia. Uh, let's welcome some friends. Hi, Elisa. Good morning to both uh, Innovation Experts. Yeah, we are actually we are here at the Castiga offices. Here, our identifier is a bull of a Castiga. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and hi, Costas, uh, uh, Guys, if you have any questions uh, while we're discussing, please drop them in the comments and glad to answer them about whatever innovation, disruption, whatever creativity. Um, yeah, okay, it's interesting, how do you put creativity in organizations, in innovation, especially in Cyprus, that <laughs> a lot of people, okay, they don't understand uh, the benefits, the... Okay, um, if we come to a basic definition of creativity, um, a very basic definition is we imagine something new and make it happen. So this definition places emphasis on the importance of imagination, on the importance of something new, and we might argue how new does it have to be a, a, a something which is new for the whole world, or is it something which is new for what we are going to, for the organization that we're working in, for example. So how new is a question, but it has to be something new. And we imagine it and make it happen. So creativity is action. It's not just thinking about it. Imagination is crucial, but it's only half the story. The other half is making it happen. So with that in mind, um, how do you foster creativity? Cre creativity is expressed at a personal level, it's expressed at a team level, at a level of uh, friends, at an organizational level, at a community level, at a societal level. If we stay at the organizational level, um, the first thing is fostering creativity in individuals, fostering creativity in teams, in which the mechanics and the techniques for working alone or in teams, some of them are similar, some of them are different. And then the organization itself has to create the environment, the culture, if you like, in which creativity will thrive. And you and I know it. You walk into one organization and you see that everybody is coming up with new ideas and running around and has high energy um, and is imagining and doing new things all the time. And you go into another one and you see that everybody's tired of their, and bored of their work and they're not interested in what they're doing. And you say, this organization will never be creative. So, individual, the team, and the ambiance or the culture, if you like, of the organization. If there is something I would add a little bit at the organizational level is that you also need a little bit of structure. So, it's not simply, um, it's not simply behaviors and norms. You can also have small institutions let's, and... Let's, yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, let's stay on that structure okay. and creativity. Right. Because Usually creativity is associated with unstructured stuff, ideas, yeah. flowing yeah. Uh, yes. things. Yes. How can you put a structure on creativity? I mean, that, you're, you have done a lot of workshops on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. Um, is creativity really chaos? If you walk into chaos, is that creative? No, and I, I don't think chaos by itself is creative. I think it can be very useful to create chaos, yeah. provided that afterwards you come back with some order, because don't forget, you have to do something has to happen. And it's rarely, you rarely solve a problem just by creating chaos. 
you afterwards have to create some order after the chaos. So, to answer your question more directly, um, creativity happens anyway, has always happened. Since the 1950s, a little bit earlier as well, but mostly in the 20th century um, uh, and, and after the 50s, some people came up with methods of creativity or a systematic way of being creative. The first ones to do that were the first one to do that was Alex Osborne, who's also known as the father of brainstorming, and he worked together with a man called Sidney Parnes, and I was I'm very honoured because I met Sidney Parnes. Sidney Parnes was a professor at the University of New York State, and the two of them created the first creative problem-solving model. So. Um, can you put organization and structure and creativity? Yes, you can. It doesn't mean that chaos isn't good. It's good, but put chaos in its place. Place it somewhere. That's how you make your creativity efficient. Otherwise, you have um, creativity which might be wasted. Yeah. Uh, correct. And... Um before we go more, let's welcome some more people. Christos Kipris, Zinas, George, Minas, uh, Umid is joining yeah. us, is watching us. Uh, yeah, guys, if you have any questions about for Dimis, uh, about innovation, creativity, disruption, feel free to pop them in the comments and uh, we will answer them. Uh, okay. A lot of people in Cyprus is something that we discuss also when we first meet back two, three, one month ago and uh, they don't understand the difference of innovation and the difference of disruptive innovation. So I want your, your, your definition, your comments on what actually is disruptive innovation. Okay, if I go completely back to basics for a very basic definition of innovation like I did for creativity, I would say it's something new and useful. Because innovation encompasses the idea of value. It's not novelty for novelty's sake, it's new and useful. Then you might argue, how new do I have to create? I don't think anybody would disagree that when Google launched and scaled up its search engine, that was a huge innovation. So it's something really very new compared to the world before it. Even though Google wasn't the first one to do the, um, the search engine. It was engine. an innovative, exactly. an innovative model. And it was way. very big. So one scale, one side of the scale is it's breakthrough. It's completely new. We're inventing a new industry. Now on the other end of the scale is, um, or, or somewhere in the middle if you like, is we don't have to reinvent a new industry. Remember, if you're, if you're inventing a new sector, it's a new product, it's a new market, it's a new way of doing things, everything is new. But you don't have to reinvent a business. You can um, do innovation that is disruptive as well by um, reinventing or disrupting an existing business. I'm thinking of, think of IKEA in furniture. Furniture making, the commerce of furniture is as ancient as um, yeah. civilization is, okay? And then a Swedish company comes and says, this is how we're going to sell furniture now. We shall scale it up, it shall be flat packed, we shall display it on huge surfaces. It's a completely new way of, um, of creating and commercializing uh, uh, furniture and we're going to be very well priced and they priced out hundreds of furniture businesses by coming up with this great concept. So um, these are disruptors, I would call them differentiators, who really do something very different in the value chain. And here, um, somewhere here between here and the Google, uh, which is a real big break breakthrough, you have the technology of platforms, which is easily accessible, not so easily scaled up. Um, a lot of people are fooled into thinking yeah, yeah, that you can scale it up very easily. It's not that easy to do it. Sure, there is a lot of um, yeah. activities in Europe right now, how to manage to scale, 
how you manage to scale in Europe something, the tech platform, because Europe, right. Europe has its uh, different cultures, different. So sure. it's one of the key challenges also for the European Commission. Now, how, how, you do, how do you scale up in Europe? Sure. It's a, it's a half billion market, but... But there are fragments to it fragments. and there are legislations yeah. you have to... Uh, uh, one of... Before we go, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah. Christos Zinonos, it's one of your students in Napoli. Okay. In as Hello, Christos. Christos also have a tech blog, CY, it's a tech blog about technology. Uh, greetings to Mr. Dimis, a great lecturer in Napoli. He was teaching me the leadership. Hello. Hi, man. Thanks for watching. Uh, Christos is a very good mm. friend, always supporting the Lab Cyprus. Hi, Marius. Marius Pesha is watching. Hello, uh, Mr. Stone from the University of uh, Cyprus University of Technology and others. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments like Christos did. And yeah, that's Okay, Sorry, let's um, what happens with platform technology, to a large extent, you, or in many, many cases, you don't need physical assets or other people provide the physical assets. I'm thinking of Uber or um, Airbnb um, are examples where other people have physical assets. So it's relatively cheap to get into the business, unlike IKEA, which has huge showrooms and there's a huge investment in physical assets to make that happen, especially on a world scale. So platform technology is reasonably easy to enter into, but it's not that easy to scale up. And a lot of people are fooled um, at that point. Now, there is another type of innovation as well. And this is in existing companies who have a business and all they need is to be a little bit faster than their competitors. Yeah. We call that Kaizen or continuous improvement. Is it innovation? I think it is innovation. It is improvement. It is new and useful for the company or for its clients. So in this scale of big breakthrough, medium kind of differentiation or disruption and continuous improvement, you have a big scale of things which I call innovation. Yeah, according to many studies, there is different type of innovation, yes. radical uh, exactly. innovation, uh, disruptive technologies, um, according to Clayton Christensen, uh, disruptive innovation is the innovation, as you said, uh, creating new markets. That's the difference. As well, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, let's welcome more people. Anthi from Anthi Hajikiriago, pressure manager at Deloitte, Elena Andreu, Elena, it's a, it's a season uh, digital marketeer. Uh, hi guys, hi Marcel from the community in Larnaca, the, they have a community, uh, it's a big community of entrepreneurs, digital nomads in Larnaca. Uh, um, Hello. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, we have a question, so let's go to the question because, uh, from Gosnesar Giridis, um, do you mean that the, that the innovation in Google has the outcome of the search engine or the business model because the business model I find it more disruptive as per your explanation. Um, it's clear the question, or shall I? Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, I think it is because Google now is many things. It's not just the search engine. But I use the search engine as an example of a breakthrough or radical innovation that really produced um, great change in the It's affected nearly everybody. Everybody who's online is, has been affected by Google. Okay, now Google is many other things now. Uh, among other things, it's um, in autonomous vehicles, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. It's part of that technology. It's not the only one. We're discussing yeah. when Google started, not. Yes, I was right talking. Now it's a full blown business with different business models, different products, different. Right, but it's consistent in the fact that it is um, it is tech based, it is uh, data based, it's big data based, yeah. um, and it's trying its luck. In, in Google, social media, in, they, in vehicles, etc. In Google, et they have this 80 20 rule. Uh, probably yeah. you know that uh, they give yeah. the people, their employees, they give them the 20% that, like, one yes. day of the week they can do any project that yes. might be funded by Google. Yeah. How do you see that um, in terms of creativity, innovation in the company? 
and, and in terms of the employee relation. I'm glad you asked this question because you asked me before, um, is there structure, can there be organization in innovation? Of course there can be. This is one example of a system. A company, um, every existing business has two things to do. Well, one is make money from its existing business uh, for its shareholders and to survive. And secondly, innovate. Now, this means that its people have to spend time both running the business and innovating. Now, different people might have different proportions of their time. And one way um, to do it is the way Google is acknowledging this. And Google is acknowledging this by saying, look, 20% of the time of all our engineers must be on looking out for new things. And they have to be radically new things. They don't, they don't like continuous improvement. They don't want 10% improvements in efficiency. They say if it's 500%, we'll think about it. But this, this is how a lot of products like Google News yeah. started. Like if you read, uh, actually I'm finishing our book, The Google Story. It, uh, it's a very good book that it explains mm -hmm. how uh, how many products were created by by applying this rule. Yeah. This, uh, okay, let's welcome some more people. Okay, Dimitris Hajis of Oakley, Dimitris is the manager of the Center of Social Innovation in Cyprus. Right. If you need, need something, you can speak to Dimitris, he's very knowledgeable. And, but, because Dimitris also is uh, watching um, uh, social innovation. Yeah. I know you are, you are a pro. Uh, uh, social innovation. What do we mean by social? So innovation yeah, I mean, is something social new. Social enterprises. Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, if if innovation is something new and useful, it can be applied in public service. It can be applied in uh, uh, private companies, and of course, it can be social in nature. By which we mean the the benefits do not accrue to the owners and creators of the business only. The benefits go somewhere to some section or to the whole of society or community. Um, I think um, social innovation is important, very important, and I fully support um, people who are using their creativity, who are deploying their innovation for social causes. And uh, okay, one of the problems of social innovation is how you make all these. Now a lot of NGOs are yeah. sparing up globally. Right. How do you make sustainable? Yeah, I think one of the problems is how do you scale it up? Yeah. Because to um, if if you look at NGOs, you have NGOs which are very local, and you have some excellent innovations happening, but it is difficult to replicate them or they're not replicated, and sometimes this is because the culture or the social system or the ecosystem, if you like, of one place varies a, no varies a lot from the originator's ecosystem or whatever. So they're harder to scale up. However, um, I believe that there, there are NGOs who can scale up their innovation, and they should be trying to do that. We have a good example, uh, I mean, we have many examples um, in Cyprus. Uh, one of them, which I, uh, I'm particularly fond of, is um, uh, Inno Cyprus, which yeah, is uh, Cyprus Inno, yeah, which is, uh, was started by Burak, uh, Burak Dule and Stephen um, Stavrou, uh, a Greek Cypriot and a Turkish Cypriot, and they are there to accommodate, it's, I think it's the first, um, first platform or the first uh, organization, if you like, that um, is uh, bringing entrepreneurs from, uh, from both sides oh, of my, Cyprus my one, yeah. um, together. Yeah, we have, uh, yeah, with Cyprus, you know, it's uh, our partners, we're supporting them also, and we have also, now they started also with the Cyprian Enterprise Link, another Good. network, this initiative of Lead Cyprus, right. uh, that we're pushing, and it would be an innovation entrepreneurial initiative and to actually solve problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
at least identify all the problems that uh, we have uh, Island Way. Even if we can manage to do that until July that we will have the workshop, identify a lot of problems, I believe that would be some worthwhile. Uh, and oh. uh, this is come my next question about, let's say, problem solving, creativity, yeah. well, scientific method. Well, um, I referred to Osborne and Parnes before. What Osborne and Parnes did, they formalized the first creative problem solving method methodology and what is that and it's uh, it stands it it stands the test of time um, this methodology they say when you have a problem um, to resolve to do this creatively do it in stages and that's why it's very good that lead cyprus is spending um, is investing a lot of time and effort in defining problems. Yeah, so yeah, we started that from March and we're planning to define so, so problems until July. Sure. So, so, so speak with the people, go local, go... But what, yeah. what, 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 the, what the approach is, is first you define the problem, then, and you spend time in doing that, it's very important. Um, even Einstein, uh, I think, once said, if I have to solve a problem, I spend 99% of the time trying to define it and 1% of the time trying to resolve it. But um, then there's finding the solution and then there's putting the solution into action. So there are at least three stages in this process. And uh, what we do at each stage, which links a little bit to one of your previous questions, is first we think creatively, we create the chaos, the big lists of things we could do, then we make choices, then we evaluate. But we don't do creative and critical thinking at the same time. First we do the creative thinking, which has a lot of breadth, but no depth. Then we do the critical thinking, which has depth, which has evaluation, and which in the end has to involve choices. Uh, yesterday you were we met at uh, the you were doing an opening workshop at the Interreg I three. How 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 was the workshop? Uh, you interacted with uh, people from five countries. Oh, it was a it was a lovely experience. It was um, I think out of about sixty people, when I asked them how many of you are entrepreneurs now or wish to start your own business um, very soon. Uh, sometime soon, about 75% of them um, said that they have their own business or they're about to start it. And um, there were people from five countries, I think Albania, Bulgaria, Northern Macedonia, yeah. Greece and Cyprus. Yeah, Cyprus. And it was good to see the chemistry between uh, people of these different countries. And Okay, if you said uh, you said right now, um, uh, why you are speaking, I had a question, but I forgot. It's okay. And, uh, it's a question about, yeah, do you think uh, everybody can become an entrepreneur? No. I think there are people who don't want to become entrepreneurs, and if they don't want to, they shouldn't. Okay? I think there's a mindset. Uh, to becoming an entrepreneur. You can develop the mindset. I don't think anybody's born with the mindset. We're all, uh, we're all different. We develop differently. And some people um, do have this mindset and they go ahead and do it with all the risks that it involves. Um, a lot of them do not succeed. That's part of the game. Okay. In your opinion, uh, when a startup starts or yeah. a business or Let's almost let's discuss a bit more the startup uh, because the startup wants also to go global. Okay. And you have a, you're a global speaker. You have experience on that. Uh, what are the first steps that someone needs to do? Uh, to go in global. Uh, not not going global. When when they start, uh, what are the key elements? Uh, okay. Uh, Everybody except innovation, but also everybody who starts up a business knows that day one they have five. 50 priorities. Um, one of them is to is as simple as find a lawyer to register the company and others are more complex like what's my vision or what's my mission? Where, what, what do I really want to do? And this at the beginning is often very blurry 
Um, I don't think either Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or, um, or Zuckerberg um, really, um, really thought of their companies as they are today when they were starting up. But they did have a vision. They did see um, a little bit into the future. So you have to have that. You have to in some way structure it. You have to in some way transform it into numbers. And venture capitalists and bankers and financiers have this thing, we want to see a business plan. They're right. Um, you do have to have a business plan. You do have to have um, num numbers that add up um, and future numbers that add up yeah but and that's and also a misconception about startups in, yeah. in cyprus uh, because a lot of people they tell into the startups that you don't have need a business plan just start get the feedback from the people but again when you start you need to have at least an outline it doesn't have to be a, yeah. a 100 business plan yeah. there is business model canvas there are lean modeling yeah. you can use uh, a lean way to to do stuff but again it's a type of business plan. It's your plan. Exactly. And you have to make a decision. Do I spend 10% of my time doing my plan and 90% doing all the other actions or 50-50? It depends on the business, on the complexity of the business. Yeah. But there is a third element as well, Lepanis, which is very important. And this is before you even come to marketing um, and finance. Um, the the, the um, third most important, the, the second most important or one of the most important things is you need to have a good team. So yeah. you, ha you will work with other people. Sure, yeah. According yeah. to statistics, two elements are there, very yeah. important. There is also TEDx talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably have seen it. I don't remember now the name. Or uh, it uh, was about team. It yeah. was a big incubator in USA that they did a mm -hmm. wide survey. It was team and timing. Yeah. Timing when actually it takes something into because there was a lot of disruptive technologies, a lot of radical technologies that they were yeah. ahead of time. Yeah. They went ahead of time and they didn't work. For example, okay, 3D printing is here for 40 years, but now it's getting more trendy Correct. because of different elements. Yeah. We have a question in your from Antigone Melvin. Uh, do you need a mentor? I mean, the question is, in order to succeed, it has to be proven that one needs a mentor. Um, I think mentors can be helpful. They can be helpful. Please elaborate a yeah. bit on that. Okay. Uh, because I'm a guy that, okay, uh, I don't be, I believe that, yeah, you need a mentor, but no. your mentor should be at least someone that knows more about you. What, tra tra what traits this mentor needs to have? Okay, I said a mentor can be helpful, can be helpful. Um, it's not necessarily they're all always helpful or you must have a mentor. You might or might not. Um, there are a few useful things a mentor can bring. A mentor is usually somebody um, who has experience in some way of startups and will therefore be able to pretty, clear, pretty clearly um, communicate the importance of a good business plan, a good team, and taking action. Um, be able to help the, I don't like the word mentee, but whoever is being mentored, um, to help them in their first steps. So what does the one who is mentored uh, gain from this? I think um, they will probably make fewer mistakes and they will probably um, be able to learn a few things from the mentor that they will otherwise spend a lot of time um, uh, uh, learning. So it's a, a good mentor is a time saver, I think, as well yeah, as a guide. I yeah. totally agree yeah. on that uh, because I've seen it with, because I'm mentoring a lot of startups mm -hmm. from Bono and people that they are young they are, I mean, if you can manage to cut them time, not to do something that you did as a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why I believe it's important to share failure stories mm -hmm. and how we learned, especially people like uh, maybe you and I that we are in the business for 30 years, for uh, years yeah. more, I am in the business for I'm 15 older, I'm years. <laughs> um, and, um, 
Yeah, by the way, guys, if you have any questions, please drop them now because we're finishing in like 10 minutes. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, drop them in the comments and we can answer them. Um, can I tell me. Can I just spend one or two minutes, not more, on another dimension of innovation? You've, um, we've, uh, you and your work and Disrupt Cyprus too, you emphasize entrepreneurship and startups. There is another side to innovation. Innovation happens in large organizations as well. It happens in governments as well. Um, it happens in the government of Cyprus as well, much slower than what I would like to see and most citizens would like to see, but it happens. It's, um, uh, um, nothing is completely static. Now, in a large organization, it doesn't have to be a startup. IBM, for example, is more than 100 years old. It is still the company, uh, for many years, it's been the company that registers most patents in the world. The largest number of patents registered by a single company, the leader is IBM. And it's a company that is over 100 years old. And it's a company that has, um, how did they manage to do this? Well, they reinvented themselves. And there is another big challenge. Um, existing companies, they have, uh, the incumbent companies do not have the flexibilities of startups um, because startups basically have nothing to lose. They have a lot to lose if they do things um, wrong, if they upset a very large number of their existing clients, for example. But if they're ready to um, reinvent themselves, they have to face one challenge which is crucial for our times. People call it digital transformation. Um, I think digital transformation, it's a good term, but it's not, um, it's not, uh, it doesn't give you the whole story. Digital transformation is crucial because it's bringing a company to the level of technology it is today. And a similar thing happened about 25 or 30 years ago with the very fancy word re-engineering. Yes. It was basically re-engineering was bringing the IT technology of the 80s, making it happen. And the IT making happen the IT technology of the 80s is basically using the knowledge of the 70s, putting it into use. Now we're putting into use the knowledge of the last five or ten years in technology and making it happen in uh, much bigger companies. What the term digital transformation doesn't, um, doesn't um, uh, encompass in the definition is the culture change you need to move from a conventional company to a digitalized company. And that can be quite profound and that is very disruptive because the way for an existing company to innovate, usually you set up your innovation targets and you find, oh boy, I have to change the whole of my structure as well. And that's changing organization charts and telling people that they no longer have this power to do that. They have something else or they, they don't have a hundred people to order about every day. These are pretty disruptive and pretty upsetting for people uh, as well. Um, okay, at this point, okay, I don't want to get political, but uh, yeah. I know that you, in your heart, uh, you want the island to be solved, uh, to be unified. I do. Uh, like me, and let's uh, try it a bit. Okay, Cyprus, you know, it's one example yeah. of using innovation for peace building. Do you have any other ideas? Let's brainstorm now. now a bit. Okay. I mean, uh, you have any ideas that uh, might help, uh, uh, you know, combine innovation, creativity, and peace? Okay, here's um, here's um, uh, my basic view, and this is for Cyprus. Okay, no matter what solution we have in the future, including a non-solution, including never having a solution or not having it for the next fifty yeah. years, um, but. Uh, no matter what the outcome is, the people who live here, and certainly the Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, have an interest in working together well. Okay, have an interest in friendship, we have an interest in creating relations, 
Um, these relations um, are great on a friendly basis, they're great when they happen in, in communities, in societies, among artists, and it would be great if they're extended to business. And I know there are a lot of things, legalities and other, um, that are uh, stopping this. How can we forge a way ahead? From the tech revolution, from the what's happening technically, I think that things that do not involve many physical assets, they can probably cross this barrier. I'm thinking of, think of something like an Airbnb, a Cypriot one, or um, which is branded differently and sold differently. Is there any reason why this wouldn't work? There will be questions. There will be people saying, oh, but is um, who owns this property that you're renting out, etc. There will be issues. But if it doesn't involve um, uh, physical assets or things that involve exchange um, between people, but not physical exchange, it will be easier to start up than physical trade. Because physical trade has uh, a number of uh, legal barriers and a number of obs yeah, obstinate has, yeah. people who insist on keeping them there. It, it has uh, a lot of barriers, uh, yeah. but um, yeah, try. We need to try more as a country yeah. there. To now, um, let's brainstorm. Um, um, as we brainstorm, let's simply get people together to think about these things. That's why I respect um, Cyprus. You know, that's what I respect what you are doing as well. If we get people from both communities to think together, they will come out with a hundred more ideas than um, uh, the, 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 than ourselves. And actually, it's one of the yeah. goals of Lead Cyprus. Yeah, and also uh, um, uh, another thing is, uh, I'm of a different generation than you are, and there are entrepreneurs of a different generation of. Than both Every, of us. Everyone matters. Any any generation, any even kids, even kids yeah. needs to be involved in this process. To be honest, because kids they see the world on a total different yes. level than even me, um, around forty. Yeah. Uh, even you, I mean. Uh, uh, and anyhow, what are, what we are going to build for Cyprus is not for us. It's for the kids below twenty. Yes. And if you don't involve them, in, if you don't involve them in this process, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a different generation. That they are, they are, they are starting their life with uh, digital, with tablets. Right. My age, we were outside playing football. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, yeah it's a totally I, different. And if I may add, they um, different generations bear different legacies, different, um, we have experienced the past in different ways. So people of my age, my generation if you like, have experienced the past. We carry a different burden from the ones who are now in their 20s, for example. And it's very useful to get everybody, as you say, but uh, and especially the young people, and why not uh, children as well, to yeah, get together sure. as much as possible and try and see how might we break down those barriers. And the first barrier to break down is the personal one. It's not the only one, but it's the first one. It's good because uh, uh, we need to add that element to Elite Cyprus because we didn't think about it. And yeah. now that it's very, maybe it would be good to see how we combine also <clears throat> more young and generations in the, in the process. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> great. Uh, okay. uh, thank you. Do you have something else? Thank you. End? Any other comments? Just to wrap it up? Uh, no, may I um, just simply remind people who might just have joined us. My name yeah. is uh, Dimis Michalidis. I'm an author, consultant, uh, trainer and professor in the areas of leadership, creativity and innovation. Uh, my Facebook page, can I um, mention my Facebook yeah, page? Now I'm going to add them in the comments, Okay. Uh, all the Facebook page and details of Dimis. So if you want to contact him afterwards for anything. Dimis.org. Uh, Dimis.org and uh, you can do it. Uh, many thanks to all of you. A lot of people Thank you. were watching from all the watch parties because we were, we're both we're doing watch parties. 
Um, yeah, have a great week to all and see you with more life. Thank you, Panis. <laughs>